us out in the back. So we're starting the sermon now and start the clock now and everything else. Thank you guys. All right. So uh, every week I've been doing something. I've been sort of pulling back the curtain on what God's doing behind the scenes that are leading to the sermons that we're getting. And I'm doing that on purpose because I want us to not just hear the sermon, I want us to see the lengths to which God has gone in order to bring that sermon about. The kinds of miracles that he's doing on a regular basis, as, as I'll ask somebody to pray two months before it's their time to pray, they'll tell me what they're going to pray about. I won't even remember what the topic is. And the week before, I'll preach the intro to their sermon. Or they'll preach the exit from my sermon. I mean, it's extraordinary. And this has been going on for years now. God has gone to extraordinary lengths week after week after week to build one line upon another, one line upon another, one principle upon another. Today, I want to pull the curtain back a little further and show you that it's not just in the preachers that this is happening. This is the whole church that this is happening in. For years, the women's, the women's Bible study has been telling me what you preached is what's coming up next week in our study. But let me show you this one. We do Women's Connect once every quarter, roughly, something like that. And they're great. You know, you come on Saturday morning, and there's a talk, or there's worship, or there's whatever there is. And they're really, really fun, and it's a gathering time and everything else. But how, what was it? A couple of months ago, the women sat down and started praying. I'm looking at one of the women's steering team, and she's going, yeah, you're getting this right. But the idea is they sat down, and they prayed, and they said, what should we do for the next Connect? And the Lord started talking to them and said, don't do a Saturday morning gathering do a Friday night outreach. So they did. And they worked on it for months. And I thought that was just wonderful. And they did it last Friday. And I'll talk a little bit about it in just a second. But, but the bottom line is, is that they did that last Friday. And on Monday, I went out for my walk. And you know, we've been in this theme about what do you do? How do you reach? How do you connect with people who disagree with you? How do you connect with them, right? And we've been talking about that primarily internally. But I've been thinking God wants to continue to expand it, to continue to take us deep on how to become one internally. But he wanted to expand it, and literally, now this is true, I read the first line of the verse, the section of Scripture that we were in, and for the next 30 minutes, I got this download from the Lord. I have, a, I, I have my phone in front of me, and I got a headset that I can talk to it that translates pretty well into OneNote. And for 30 minutes, I just talked into my phone and talked out this sermon from one verse, which happens to be perfectly aligned with what God has told the women to do, not just on Friday night, but what God is leading the women to do in the retreat with what God is doing in this church. You see this? So he's not just orchestrating sermons week to week, which would be cool enough, right? But he's got the whole body. It's this idea of what would happen if a body really gave him control. What would he actually do? And it's extraordinary what's been happening. So I want to say something. Thank you. So I want to say something. At this point in time, it has been almost five years since we started Luke. And Luke has been a journey in how God discipled his disciples, in large part because eight years ago, God told me discipleship was in the toilet. People weren't actually becoming disciples, by which he meant, in large measure, they didn't really know who I was, and they weren't really doing what I'm asking. And so here we are five years later, which happens to be, a year and a half longer than the disciples had. <laughs> okay? And what we have been doing for those five years, how did I, did I, would you just, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Which, you guys remember this, I don't hardly even show it anymore, we've been doing it so long, I didn't want it to get too old. But the idea behind this illustration is, the Holy Spirit comes down upon us so that he can go through us to meet, to reach, to help, to touch other people. We are his hands and feet. The Holy Spirit does the work, but we have to be there, right? 
So for five years, God has been doing this in an extraordinary fashion. He's been raising up a body. We started in college where we watched and saw what Jesus did. And then I said, we're going to Masters where people are going out and doing it themselves. And the truth is, is some have, and then there's other people. Now, let me make something clear when I say that. This is really important. Do you remember something? And I understand this. I'm in the 15% of the population that does not mind con confrontation. The idea of going and talking to somebody about Christ does not scare me. Now, I can't tell you it never scared me, but I can tell you I'm in the 50, I don't like confrontation, never misunderstand that. But confrontation does, never seems like a bad thing to me, it seems like an opportunity to me. It always feels like a moment where something could happen that's different than what was happening, right? Comfort always feels like death to me. Staying where I am feels like I'm going to die. So I get it, it's easier for me to go out right? And so we have, for example, a women's Friday night, which was about, let's just be fair, about a third of the attendance of what would be Saturday morning. And maybe that was because it was Friday night. And maybe it's because, you know, um, people had other things to do and it's just different and so on. But let's be honest and real, whether or not it happened or not, let's just be honest and real. When somebody stands up here and starts talking about outreach, what do you think? What do the vast majority of people in here think? I know that I should be doing that, but I'm scared. What's going to happen? How's this going to go? What if they say this? What if this happens? What if we totally freak ourselves out to the point that we don't act? So I really want to say this something here. We're going to hear this in a second about some of the things that happened with the women, but actually let me steal from that. Here's the cool thing that happened with the women when they went out. I just got testimonies on it. And none of the women had any great, big, glorious, oh, my, you know, 55,000 people got saved. You know what they did have? Really cool stories, like we were doing something called treasure hunting. You know what that means? Treasure hunting is where you just seek the Lord, what you're supposed to do, and then you go out and do it. And they felt like God was saying, go to Bell Square. And somebody actually drew a vision, drew a vision that they had of a room it seemed like a child's room. And somebody else said, that's the exact same image I had in my mind. Where is that in Bell Square? And it turns out to be on the third floor of the children's room. And when they walked in, most of the people, I don't think any of them, who was on that trip? Had any of you ever seen that room before? I don't think anybody had seen it, right? Jan was on there. But nobody had ever even seen that room before. So they weren't drawing it from memory. They were drawing it from a vision. And when they walked in, the room was the picture. So they said, okay, we're supposed to be here. Now watch what happened, though. It wasn't that all of a sudden... A bunch of people came to the Lord. It was that they sat down and they started playing with the kids and just, you know, and everything else. And they were praying, what are we supposed to do now? And all of a sudden, one of them got this image of these are the future. These children here are the future. These are the children of powerful people that are going to have a lot of opportunity in life. You don't have to have, be a powerful child of a powerful parent. You can do that yourself, but you get the drift. These are people that are, these are our future. These are people who are going to be doing things and running things. And so they prayed for them. Now, does that sound frightening? To walk into a room, now the frightening part is, is what's going to happen, right? The unknown is terribly frightening to us, right? But the fact is, is that what they actually did, and tell me if after the fact this seems frightening, what they did was they played with kids and prayed for them. Not even, not even out loud. They just prayed for them. They interceded. God put them in a room to intercede for people that are going to make a difference in the future. Now, does that seem scary? Right? You see what I mean? When we talk about these things that we're talking about, I think people always get this in their mind. I'm going to have to move to Africa. <laughs> or worse, literally worse, I'm going to have to stand on a street corner with some tracks and accost people who are walking by. Right? That's what we think outreach is. Okay? We're hoping that it's a corporate outreach where we do some big event and I can help set up the bouncy toys and somebody else will actually talk to people. But what if outreach was entirely different than that? What if outreach was something that was so tender and careful and important, the thing that you could do easily. 
the thing that looking back on it, you went, well, that wasn't only not scary, that was wonderful. What if that's what outreach is? And let me say it this way. What if God, or just consider that God for eight years and five years in particular has been doing extraordinary things to teach us that. And what would happen if we actually responded? What would happen if we actually didn't just hear it, but we went out and did it? We just made ourselves available in a way that the Holy Spirit would then do what he wanted to do through us. What would happen if we did that? I always get Psalm 23 in my mind when I think about these things. You're in a place of comfort in green pastures and still waters, but for his name's sake, he takes you on another path. And yeah, there's a scary part in it, the valley of shadow of death. But on the other side of that scary part is a table where your cup overflows. And the things that you were previously frightened about surround you, but they no longer can touch you. Because he's taking you to a place of blessing where surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Does that sound good? Now that's the positive part of that equation. But let me take you to the place that I think God is actually taking us today. Consider for a day, without being shamed, condemned, or motivated by religiousness, or a sense of have to do something, or I'm not good enough, or whatever. I want you to consider the other side of the equation. What would happen, or what do you think, if God has put five, eight, now five extraordinary years of extraordinary investment in you, and you never respond, what happens then? Right? Well, it turns out we can see what happens then, and we're going to see it today. So with that in mind, um, what was, who was it? Oh, okay. So um, I'm so sorry, but um, I'm having a total brain freeze. You actually work for me, and I am just totally freaking out right now. So help me out, and forgive me. I'm getting so stupid old. But Chris just lost your husband. I'm <laughs> no, I'm still here. <laughs> what have you been telling them? <laughs> I'm, I'm here. <laughs> if anyone wants to do anything, let me know. <laughs> Any credibility is boom, out the door. Okay. Christy just lost her father. So would you just take a minute, Andy, and would you pray for, we'll just pray for her for a second, then pray for the sermon and lift up another church too. But love you, and I'm so sorry. And you are just, and I don't mean just because I forgot and bit a brain freeze, but I just mean, you know, losing your dad. I think a lot of us in here are, either have or are getting close to that, and it's not fun. So go ahead, Andy. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, I want to lift up Christy and everyone in this church who's lost someone you know, dear to them recently. Lord, it's not something which I've had to experience yet, Lord, but I can imagine it just be incredibly painful, um, confusing. You know, we have this hope and this, um, and this uh, knowledge that you know, Malcolm's gone on to be with you, but you know, that's... It's difficult, but Father, we t we take we reassure that you are you know your Son is the Prince of Peace, and that you sent your Holy Spirit to be our Comforter. Thank and you, Jesus. You bring about a real healing, and that it's not just something that it, it happens, you know, in a day. There's something that takes time to to process through. And we thank you for that. That you don't. You don't grow weary of us. And you Thank don't, you, Lord. Um, you, you are familiar with our pain. Thank you, Lord. Father, lift up this morning's sermon. Lord, thank just want to say thank you for this church, Lord, and the blessing um, that it's been to Christine in my life. Thank Lord, you. everyone here. Lord, I just thank you that this morning that you continue to do the work that you're doing, that you continue to change our hearts, that you continue to invest in us and also to persist with us. Amen. And Father, lastly, I lift up um, uh, Beachside Church on the in Palm Beach. And Lord, I pray that you you continue to um, bless them 
and help them fulfill their vision. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That was great. Here's the verse that I went out on Monday, and this was the next verse, and I always read the verse and ask the Lord, is this where you want me to go or somewhere else, or what do you want me to do, and everything else. And the whole verse is, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee, and the, the wording here is really weird. It's kind of like he's on an edge, okay? But as, and as he entered a village, he was met by 10 leopards who stood at a distance, and lifting up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, go and show yourself to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell, at his, at, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Okay? Now, we're actually going to do the rest of the passage next week. But this week, I want you to see the verse. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. I read that, and instantly, I just, God started downloading what was going on here. So this is what I'm sharing with you. And for some of us, you already know this. For the rest of us, let me just, if you, if you know this, bear with me. Because I want to take a minute and have you understand why that's so important. So what we understand is this is, the, this is the route that Jesus was taking. He was up here in Capernaum. He, was, he went down, and then you see how he goes back up and goes a weird little way back over towards the Jordan River from the Galilee up there, Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. And then he kind of hugs the Dead Sea down here. You see that? What he's doing right there is he's avoiding Samaria. Okay? Now, he's not actually avoiding Samaria. If you really wanted to be good Jewish, you would go across the Jordan because the border of Samaria really goes to the river, okay? So he would go across the Jordan, and that's what Jews did. You can, there's Jews up in Galilee, like Nazareth, see that? And you see that if you had to go to Jerusalem, which you have to do often, you go straight down, you go straight through Samaria. But what you have to understand is no Jew would ever go through Samaria. The, your foot touching Samaritan soil would defile you. So you don't do that. Now why is that? Okay, just real quick. What happens is, is that David and, well Saul and then David and then Solomon build the nation of God that God has promised Abraham thousands of years before, right? So the bottom line, here they are, and now they've got this, they've got this unified kingdom. But after Solomon, there's a son that comes up who's an idiot, and the people from the north say, you know, are you an idiot? And he says, yes. They say, how hard are you going to be on us? And he says, much harder than Solomon was. And they said, fine, forget you. So the ten tribes in the green leave the unified nation, fairly newly unified. And they become the ten tribes known as Israel, and down below are two tribes known as Judah. Now, these ten tribes up here do not have Jerusalem in them because I don't think I'll be able to do this well, but it, it's right towards the top of the purple there is where Jerusalem is. But it's in Judah. It's not in Israel. So the 10 tribes to the north no longer have the home of God, so to speak. And so what they do is, is they make up their own gods or more. What they do is they take the gods of the people surrounding them and they begin to appropriate those gods as their gods, right? But they do a syncretistic thing. They don't just take it wholesale for the most part. Some of them do. Some of the kings, they never have a good king in their couple hundred years of existence. They never have a good king. Every one of them follow the gods. But the point is, some of them at least have a little bit of God in there. Okay? But the vast majority of them are just totally serving other gods. And God says this to them all the time. If you keep serving other gods, I'm going to wipe you out. And then the next king comes. If you keep serving other gods, I'm going to wipe you out. If you keep serving other gods, I'm going to wipe you out. They never listen to him. And sure enough, at some point in time, a couple hundred years after, the Assyrians are called by God to come in and to wipe out the nation of Israel, the northern ten tribes. And to this day, they are gone. Now, when you are a conquering army, you have a problem. You do not want to kill everybody in the land because that makes it go fallow. And you want it to produce goods and services and wealth that you can then tax and appropriate. One of the reasons why you take over other lands is because it makes you richer, right? But the problem is... 
If you've just killed somebody's mother, father, brother, sister, baby, and now you want them to work for you, they don't like you. So the conquering army always has a problem, and the people that are left hate them, the conquerors, right? And so what happens is every single empire in the history of the world that has overtaken other lands has had a strategy for dealing with people that would hate them, but that they nonetheless have to get taxes from. The Romans did it by just being unbelievably brutal in how they killed people, namely the cross. That was an incredibly excruciating, horrible way to die, and it tended to keep people in check. And they invented ever more, and, and the cross was towards the pinnacle of the worst things that they could ever do because of how long it took and how gruesome the death was. With that said, what happens is what the Ninevites, what the, excuse me, what the uh, Assyrian strategy was, was to intermarry. They would bring in a whole lot of people from Assyria, and they would intermarry with the people of the land so that their children were both the children they had conquered but also the children of the people from somewhere else. So they were, after a generation or two, they would be just as much, you see what I'm saying? They weren't nationalistic anymore. Now, the reason why that's such a big problem for the lower two tribes, Judah, the reason why they hated them more than any other people, they thought Gentiles were pigs, but Samaritans were worse. And the reason why they thought that, and I won't follow this, it doesn't take... It's not too hard, but follow it. What happened was, is the whole world had gone after other things back in, after the garden. And then God came to one person and he said, here's the deal. I'm going to have a relationship with you and your descendants that is going to show the rest of the world what having a relationship with me is like. And so, I'm telling you, do not marry people from other places because they'll bring their other gods in. It'll syncretize you. It will it'll dumb down who I really am and what I'm trying to show people. So I'm telling you, not in racist ways or nationalistic ways, but purely because he's trying to say, I want to have a relationship with you that is distinct from the rest of the world and their gods so that people can see what a relationship with me is like versus what those other gods is like. Do you see it? So it wasn't racist or nationalistic or anything by God. It was simply him saying, I'm trying to make a light in the world that will show people something. You see it? Now, when the Assyrians forced the Israelis, the Israelites, into intermarriage, that is a total violation of that. The person from Judah can say, those people have been judged, and indeed they have. Now, let's be clear, though. The people of Judah took it in the way that we take things to places that God did not intend, and they made it racist and nationalistic and so on. God never said to hate the Samaritans. He said, learn from them. But what they did was is they hated them. And they hated them because they were the impure. They were, to use the racist term, half-breeds, in the worst sense of that term. And that's a hurtful term, so I apologize if anybody got hurt by it, but I want you to catch the depths of what the Jewish person thinks about Samaritans. This is why they will not even step foot in there, because that is going to defile them, and look what God does to people who are defiled. That would be kind of almost on the okay side of things, but it became, we're the chosen people, you're not. You see it? And that's its worst expression. And in that regard, then, what we see is we see Jesus not going through Samaria when he's going down. But he's right on the edge of it. I want you to think about that for a second. When, when 10 people get healed, he tells them to go where? To the priests. A Samaritan doesn't go to a priest, to the priest. A Jewish person goes to the priest. So there's obviously Jewish people in the 10 that have been healed. In fact, Jesus calls it out. Weren't there 10 other people? Only the foreigner comes back? Meaning there was other people? A direct metaphor for what's going to happen shortly in Israel. Some people are going to believe in Jesus and other people are not. Only the foreigners are going to believe him, the Gentiles. 
en masse and come and thank him and worship him. You see it? So at the very end of his journey, this is the last trip that Jesus takes. He goes in, by the time he gets down in that red, this was just the, the last days. When he gets into Jerusalem, he'll die. And then he'll be around for 40 days and then he'll ascend and that's it. So on the last journey towards the end, he does this. He makes a point to be dancing on the edge and doing something that the disciples ought to learn something from. The Jews didn't come back. The foreigners did. You see it? What's he saying to the disciples right at the very end? You're not just about the Jews. You're supposed to be going to everybody. See how he's making that? Now, by the way, this isn't the first time he's made this point. You do remember the woman at the well, right? Well, this is a time where Jesus said, to heck with that whole Samaria stuff, and he literally went right into Samaria. And he met a woman at the well, and remember, everyone was like, first of all, you're not supposed to talk to a woman, and secondly, you're talking to a Samaritan? Now watch what happens. This is so cool. Watch this. He tells her about, you know, you know she says, he says, give me some water, I can, you know, da, da, da. And, and he says, yeah, I know, you're not, you know, you've been married several times, and the one that you're married to isn't even your husband. She runs off, left her water jar beside the well, and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? Because there was still a Jewish heritage in the Samaritans. So the people, now listen to this, so the people came streaming from the village to see him, and they were at this time of year dressed in white. So the people are coming, and who are the people that are coming to him? They're not Jewish people. They're the hated Samaritans. They're streaming to him. This is towards the beginning of his ministry, by the way. You think he's trying to make this clear from the very beginning? Then Jesus explained, oh, the, the, the disciples come back and they say, they say, here, eat something, eat something, and he won't. And they say, he says, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Think about that. See what I mean? Catch the metaphor of it too. You're thinking it's about this. I'm telling you it's about something else. I'm showing you how it's about something else. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God. Wait a minute, the, Judah, the people from Judah who are now called the people of Israel, they do not think of going to Samaritans as the will of God. They think the opposite of that. That is not possibly what God's will could be. Right? Maybe the Gentiles, but surely not those people. Doing the will of God who sent me and I am finishing his work. He's the one doing this. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up. See, quit having your blinder, myopic blinders on, thinking it's all about Jews. Wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe, and the word is white, for harvest. Who's streaming out right now in white? Do you see what he's telling them? He's telling his disciples, Look, the harvest. Somebody else has sown, and here it comes. Do you think he's saying, get outside your comfort zone? Do you think he's saying, get outside the, your, your, your own group with whom you are familiar? Do you see it? Now, it doesn't just end there. Here's a really cool one, okay? This is that thing. He was a Samaritan, but, but now watch. He does say at one point in time, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. Oh, well, Kurt, he's not going after the Gentiles at all, right? Well, wait, let's read the whole story. Because it starts, a Gentile woman, Gentile, lived there, came to him pleading, have mercy on me, O son of David. My daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. And then Jesus does something. I, I can't find, maybe somebody else can, but I can't find another place where he ever did something like this. He gave her no reply, not even a word. He didn't say anything. He never does that. When people come to him, he responds so as to model how to respond. But we're at chapter 15. We're well into them being discipled now. And this is, an, this is a test. And he's saying, how are you guys going to respond to this woman whose daughter is in need? What are you going to do? What did they do? Tell her, go away, they said. She's bothering us with all her begging. 
Now, do you think if it had been a Jewish person there, they would have said that? Do you see it? They would have got it, wouldn't they? But they say, send her away. And so what does Jesus say? He says what they want him to say. I'm only for the Jews. Even then, she comes back and says, worship and pleading again, Lord, help me. And Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Oh my gosh, that's the worst thing Jesus ever said to anybody almost. Right? He just called a woman whose daughter was in such need that she's begging him to help her in faith. And his response is, you're a dog. <laughs> this is horrible. And the disciples recorded in the Gospels because they're trying to get us to understand something about what Jesus was trying to teach them. Because the next thing that happened is extraordinary. She replied, that's true, but even the dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath the master's table, implying that that's enough for me. Dear woman, Jesus said, your faith is great. Whose faith isn't? The disciples. Your faith is right. Your understanding is right. You have the truth. Your request is granted and her daughter was instantly healed. Do you think that God maybe, that Jesus has maybe been trying to teach people throughout the whole of the New Testament, throughout the Gospels, that they were supposed to go to people other than just the Jews? Do you think he was trying to break through this mentality that had developed amongst them where he meant for them to be a people distinct so he could show his relationship, but his intent was not that they should be more special or separated in a more, in a, in a I'm better than you sense, but rather that he meant them to be a light to help the whole world? Because, by the way, this is not just found in the New Testament. This is right back all the way in Genesis, for heaven's sakes. At the very beginning, when he picks Abraham, you know one of the first things he says to him? Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. <laughs> so what was his goal in going to Israel? It wasn't Israel. It was the world. All the nations. And over and over and over and over is that wording repeated. In fact, it's repeated all the time through the Old Testament. And then, at the end of his time with the disciples, Jesus gives them the Great Commission, which says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of who? All the nations. And then, the very last words that he ever says to him, He has died, he has resurrected, he's been with him for 40 days, and now he's going to be captured up into heaven, okay? The Father alone has authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Because they're asking him, when is this all going to happen? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, the, the thing that we've been learning for five years, and because of that, because of the Holy Spirit upon you, through you, you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. Where? In Jerusalem, got it. In Judea, got it. But look at what's number three. <laughs> He's telling the disciples right here, <coughs> after having mo modeled it throughout his ministry, to Samaria, and not just Samaria, the ends of the earth. So right now, clearly, we're his disciples. We get it. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was perfect. <laughs> right? We... <sighs> the patience of God is surpassing what anybody even thinks is reasonable. but never thinks that it's endless. His love is endless, but his patience comes to a head, at which time he does something in order to bring about something else because the something he wants to bring about isn't gonna happen unless he does that. You see that? Surely the disciples get this cleanly. Well, here's what he does. Peter is sitting on that. He's sleeping up top of his house. A vision, it's, it's a sheet that comes down filled with unclean animals. It says, kill and eat. 
Peter says, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. What's he talking about? Clearly Gentiles. Now the same vision had it repeated three times. <laughs> Just in case, right? And then the angel says, now some people are coming. Go with them even though you won't want to. Even though you don't think it's right. Even though you don't think it's God. I'm telling you, you're wrong. Go with them. So some people come from Cornelius, a Gentile. He goes to the house. He says, I'm not even supposed to be in this house. But God told me to be here, and I guess I need to talk to you about Jesus. So he starts talking about Jesus, and not only do the people get saved, the whole household gets saved right there. Not only does everybody get saved, but right then and there, the exact same thing happens to the Gentiles as what happened to the disciples on the day of Pentecost. How much more clear can God make it? And sure enough, because people do not get it yet, when Peter comes back to Jerusalem to tell everybody about this, Christians who stress circumcision argue with him saying, but you went to an uncircumcised man and you ate with them. <laughs> You're not supposed to do that, right? Peter explains to them what happened and their response, praise God, is... When the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. And they said, we can see that God has also given Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. So now we're done, right? <laughs> Years later, Paul is in the field bringing the gospel to the world. The people back in Jerusalem say, you're like you're doing something bad. You're like, we get that God's going to the Gentiles, but you do have to understand, right, Jesus? You do get that eating with Gentiles is bad, right? You do get that they're still unclean, right? You do get that they still need to be circumcised. You still get that they still have to come under the law, right? Which, of course, is precisely what is wrong. What Jesus came to set us free from, God gave the law not so that everybody would learn how to live perfectly, they certainly could have, but we proved over a couple thousand years that we never will. And so God came and made another way to be right with him. His own son and receiving his son, by which then God calls us righteous and puts the Holy Spirit in us who leads us into how to actually live with God. But the point is, they call him back and they say, Here's what they say. Now, this is years later, years later, years after that whole Cornelius thing, years after all the things that God has done to show this. Some of the believers who belong to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted, most believers, the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. You see it? I'm going to Africa, and the way to make Christians is to get them to dress in black pants and white shirts and wear ties. That's what Christianity means. Did you see it? It's what I think in my cultural context that matters, not entering into whatever their context is because God is the maker of them too and entering into who they actually are and finding them. The world's best, in my opinion, missionary ever. I, I want to say it was Cunningham, but somehow I'm going to get this story wrong. I'm just thinking of it right now, and so if I get the, the name wrong. But he goes into India. He's being incredibly unproductive. I think it was Cunningham that told the story. That's right. And that's what, there's a founding of That's what it is. But the point is, is this missionary goes in, and he's in India, and he's telling these stories about God and everything else, and nobody's listening, and nobody's coming to Christ, and he doesn't know what to do. And finally, he just gives up. He's ready to quit. And what happens is, is that all of a sudden, God prompts him, and he says, ask him what their stories are. You've been telling them your stories. Ask them what their stories are. And so he says, what are your stories? And they say, oh, well, see, there were these people over those mountains there, back over in this distant land that we, you know, over there, which is the Middle East and Israel. And, and, this, and this thing happened where people got sinful, and then they, there was a flood, and then there was this time when they built this tower, 
And then the, God said, no, that isn't right. And so he separated everybody. And we came over the mountain to be these people. But we were told to wait until somebody would come and explain to us what that was all about. They said, well, let me tell you what that was all about. And they went, oh, and they all received Christ. It became the beginning of a phenomenal revival in the area. I, I think, look, to a very real extent, I'm preaching to the choir here. But here's how you make this real. I can tell inspiring stories about going to India and meet reaching India, and we can all be inspired by it. But if I tell you to walk out the doors of this church and go talk to your neighbor... I love that. Thank you. Right? You know, thank God that we can actually get real. Right? We cannot get past until we understand what is for real. Not for fake, not put on the religious facade, and therefore always miss God. But if we actually start owning what's true in our own hearts, our own lives, our own experience... Paul comes back and he says this about it at one point in time. Peter came to Antioch. I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers. He was becoming one with them, which is, remember, Jesus' last prayer. I pray that they all become one, as you and I are one. But afterwards, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of the criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. And as a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. Even Barnabas got carried away by this nonsense. You see it? And the key that I'm going after, I told you that what we're doing today is we're saying, what happens when people don't respond? And what he says in this is when people came from James. And who's James? This is not James the Apostle. This is James, the brother of Jesus, who by nepotism was the head of the church in Jerusalem. And I, you can argue with me, and I don't, it's okay if you do. I don't care. But my belief is, is that James was not supposed to be the head of the church. Jesus clearly said nepotism isn't what it's about. You're all my brothers and sisters. And I think that they could have appointed somebody in the church that would have done something different than what James did because here's what James did. James made Christianity a sect of Jewishness. In the beginning, Christians were being persecuted because they were saying something about something new that God was doing that didn't fit in Jewishness. By the end, do you know that the Christians weren't being persecuted anymore? Why? Because they fit in, they were just a sect. There was no distinction. People were still being circumcised. They were still not eating blood. They were still not doing this. They were still not doing that. They were still doing all kinds of things. They hadn't become something new. They hadn't become something of revelation. They hadn't become the gospel, the good news of the freedom that we have, of the new thing that God does when he makes us new. Are we catching it? So here's my question. What happened to the church in Jerusalem? What happened to it? Ultimately, you know, it dies in 70 AD. I mean, completely dies. Now, to be fair, so does all of Jerusalem, so does all of Israel, because they're rebelling against the Romans who have taken them over, and they're, you know, a conquering power, putting down the locals. And the bottom line is, is they come down, they lay siege to Jerusalem out of, out of feast time where there's a million people in a 100,000 person city, and by the time they're done, there's about 90,000 that live. And that's the end of Israel, that's the end of Jerusalem. And that, until 1940s, there is no more Israel. So there's no church in Jerusalem because there's nobody in Jerusalem, really. Right? I mean, it's just all done. But let's be fair. The church in Jerusalem was dead long before it actually stopped. This is a picture that takes place. Do you see the purple places? It's kind of hard to see on this. But do you see the purple that's there? And then you see the purple that's up where Paul was when he was in Antioch. And then you see that island that you get Acts stories of. And then you see over here in that little blip, you see that big purple part? That's where the churches are. In fact, all the churches in Revelation are from that area right there. And then you see it over here in Greece as Paul sailed down in Greece. And then Corinth is down here. Uh, I, I say down here. Where's the, where's the thing? How do I make the... What's that? Very top. If I do something really bad, okay... 
But here's, so here's the place where the churches are from. Here they are over here in Greece. This is where Lydia and everybody gets saved. This is now down in Corinth. They go through this eventually after several trips around and in here. He goes over here, and then he goes, this is Rome, and this is where it is. Now some of these areas were touched before the church in Israel was dead, and some of these areas come after. These areas over here come a little bit later after Jerusalem's dead. But here's the point. By the time 70 AD rolls around, Jerusalem, which should be the head of the whole church in the world, right? That's where it started, right? It's a footnote. Paul is actually raising money from all these other places in order to help those poor people back in Jerusalem who were broke. Why? Why isn't it going well? Because they're not doing what God's asked them to do. They're not being disciples. They're not going out and telling people the good news. They're not going out and allowing themselves to be used by God to make a difference in another person's life. See it? In your packets is this. This is a stop and pray card. You're going to notice that it's different than the normal stop and pray cards. And I'm asking you to do something. Some of you actually really faithfully take these home and put them up on your doorpost. I think a lot of people already have one there, and so they say, I'm good. But you never see it anymore, and you don't stop anymore, right? The one or two times you might have, you don't anymore. So would you do me a favor? Would you just take this right now and just stick it in your Bible or wherever so that it makes sure it gets home with you? And then when you get it home, would you do me a favor? Would you actually put it up on your door? And you're going to see something about it here in one second about why this is so important. John McGaw is a very good friend of mine. Thank you. John McGaw is a very good friend. He's a pastor back in New Jersey. God's been saying, God, God's not just telling me the things that we're doing. He's telling the whole church it, and I just happen to be tuned into his frequency. And so I'm hearing the same thing as pastors I'm talking to all over the country are hearing. He's back in New Jersey. He's hearing the same thing about discipleship and people not actually doing and, and what that means because the church is dying, even though it doesn't know it, because it dies slowly. The lobster in the pot getting cooked. But the bottom line is, as John says, he's writing a sermon on evangelism, trying to get people to evangelism, and just says, what's the point of this? What's the point of preaching yet another sermon about reaching out to people and being used by them? It's not going to come to anything. And God tells him, great, then do this. Don't meet for the next 10 weeks. Not the next 10, because they took two or three weeks to cast vision for it and build it. He did an excellent job of building it upright. But the point is, is they then took, his church took 10 weeks off in the fall. The fall's the worst time to take things off in the church. Do it in the summer when nobody wants to come anyway. <laughs> right? That's good planning. But God takes the heart of their season and tells them, don't meet for 10 weeks. After four weeks, John said, I've done it. I've ruined the church. Nobody's getting it. People aren't doing it. They're all going to leave. I killed the church. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? But then sparks started happening. And by the 10th week, he said, should we get back together and meet ever again? They didn't lose one person, by the way, doing this. And the people said, yeah, on one condition, that we figure out how not to lose what we've gained over these last 10 weeks. Because what we've been doing over the last 10 weeks is better than what we ever did when we got together on Sunday morning. This is the real stuff. The stuff we do on Sunday morning has its import, has its moment, has its thing. But let's do this instead. You see it? Now, there's people in here going, oh my God, Kurt is going to cancel church for 10 weeks. I can't take this. I want to tell you, I do not have any leading from the Lord to do that yet. <laughs> and let, what's that? It's not fall yet. I do want to tell you, it certainly is something I'm praying about. I'm praying, I've got some other, already some ideas about how we could do it in a slightly different manner and so on. But the fact of the matter is, this is so important to me that we may as well kill the church now as later if we're just going to die a slow death. I couldn't love you more. If this is condemning you, oh my God, please, just do not hear that. I'm saying this in love. What I'm saying is, as the pastor of a church, I'm saying I want everybody to come. That's what pastors do. They want to move as slowly as it takes the slowest person. Prophets are always, we have to do this yesterday. And I'm prophetic. But I'm also pastoral, and I want us to all come. And so we're going to do something today. And what we're going to do is 
There's up on the stage here, all over the front of the stage are a bunch of pieces of leather. And oh, I somehow it came apart on me. Sorry, don't let that happen ever. But what we're going to do is, you know what a phylactery is? This is what the Jewish people use. And they put it on their forehead and they put it on their arm. And what they're saying is, I want my mind to get right. But their hand is about, it's from the heart. And I'm extending the heart of God to you with my hand. So that's why they wrap it all the way out to the furthest finger. See that? That's the heart thing. And so what they're doing is they're saying, I want the word to go out to you. So what we've done here is, is that we've got a whole bunch of strips of leather. So it's sort of flactry ish And that, by the way, is what's on the stop card. Okay? And what I want you to do for one week, I'm not asking you to do this forever. If you want to do it longer than that, thank God, but don't do it for long. But here's what I'm saying. For one week, I want you to do this. I want you to take this piece of leather and tie it around your wrist. You can't do it yourself. Somebody will have to help you. Okay? Nice little metaphor there. Okay? But I want you to tie it around your wrist. And for one week, every time you see it, I want you to think to yourself, I'm supposed to be reaching out to people. I prefer you do it on your left. The heart of God reaching out to people. Now, just in case you really can't wear a leather strap for whatever reason, I did get you some super cheesy, cheap stamps. Okay? And you could just stamp yourself. But let me warn you right now, they don't work very well. Okay? And they're really cheesy. Okay? So if you want to be cool, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, okay, but I really am serious. What I want us to do is I want us to come up, and here's what we're doing. We're asking you to come forward rather than put these at your seats, because here's what we're saying. Take a step. By the way, if you're not willing to take a step right now, have integrity before the Lord and don't. If you're not willing to really do this, let him do what he wants to do through you. That's, this step is saying, I don't know how to do this. I'm afraid. I'm not sure. I don't understand. But I'm going to respond. And I'm telling you, if somebody sits in their chair, do not judge them. Respect the fact that they're counting the cost of the tower before they make their decision. Don't let the mood and the moment carry you forward. Come forward because you feel like the Lord is telling you to do this. Right? And then come forward as a physical act of saying, I am willing to step out, do something that's not comfortable. Come forward, put this leather strap on me, wear it for a week. Somebody asks me what it is, I'm going to tell them. Can I tell you right now? Somebody's going to get saved because somebody's going to ask somebody about a leather strap. Because that's how God works. It's not prophetic, it's just numbers. Do you see it? Let's do this. Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, you are magnificent. You're surpassing magnificence. You're glorious in the things that you have for us, though we do not understand them, though we are uncertain, unsure, and even frightened of. We nonetheless trust because 